Um, and then we'll get started. All right. So I apologize for being a couple minutes late here. We're having some technical difficulties. I will start off by saying I've never done anything like this before. I've obviously talked to to groups of people before, and I talked to patients obviously all day long now with this type of, of uh, medium. Um, but the whole social media thing is definitely a new experience for me. So it's a brave new world, and we're gonna we're just gonna roll with it. So. We wanted to come here tonight to, um, thank you for everybody saying hi. Um, I don't feel so alone. Um, so uh, we wanted to come to you tonight because despite all of the craziness happening in this world, there um, are a lot of really exciting things happening in the fertility community in, in New Hampshire. Um, so we wanted to talk a little bit um, about those, those changes um, uh, and, and what's been happening uh, with you tonight. Um, and then I will open it up for, for some questions. Um, so I hope, I hope you have some. <laughs> um, so the, the first thing that um, happened at the beginning of the year, pre-pandemic, um, is we had a, a very favorable insurance law that was passed. Um, so when I first started, um, at, at, uh, uh, moved to New Hampshire and started um, practicing in 2011, most patients who lived and worked in New Hampshire um, did not have insurance coverage for fertility treatment, so most of them were self-pay. That was a contrast um, compared to most patients who lived uh, in Massachusetts, where there's there are favorable laws um, that allow insurance companies to cover um, treatment of infertility. Um, so fast forward to 2019, um, a bill was introduced to the New Hampshire House um stating that infertility is a, a, a disease um, and that it's a, an essential health service to provide treatment of that disease with fertility treatment um, and that law was passed uh, and signed into law last year um, and went into effect on january 1st of 2020 um, so we're seeing many more patients now that have insurance coverage um, for treatment of infertility which is is fantastic it's it's increased the number of, of people who are able to access treatment um it doesn't cover everybody unfortunately we, we wish that it did um so there are um patients who who still don't have uh, infertility treatment coverage and, and we do have obviously self-pay um, options for those patients um but um, that was something really excited that exciting that um that happened um in our community at the beginning of the year um the other development that's happened this year is that we are opening a freestanding um, IVF center right here in New Hampshire. So this will be the first um, freestanding IVF uh, center in, in the state. So right now um, we have, as some of you probably know, a full service um, satellite uh, here in uh, Bedford, New Hampshire. We do consults there. Um, we do ultrasound monitoring there. We do um, non-surgical procedures at, um, and ultrasounds. Um, but for the IVF treatments, um, patients um, at this point in time have to travel to, to Waltham to, in order to uh, Massachusetts in order to do the surgical procedures that are associated with IVF. So that would be egg retrieval procedures uh, and embryo transfer procedures. And that's where the lab is that um, that does the puts the eggs and the sperm together. And then that's where we store embryos. So all of that is going to be coming locally um, to New Hampshire by the end of the year, which is really fantastic. So patients won't have to travel as far um, to access that that treatment. Um, so we're, we're really excited about that development and hope hope to see hope to see you all there. Um, and then uh, finally, I just wanted to um, introduce, there's a couple of new experts that are available to us in the New Hampshire community. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I've been practicing in New Hampshire since 2011 when I moved from Vermont. Um, I'm very pleased that Dr. Tom Toth is going to be joining me um, two days a week in New Hampshire. Um, he's already started doing that and he'll be um, doing IVF procedures with me in New Hampshire as well. Uh, Tom has one of those long resumes that it would probably take me 15 minutes to, to go through, so, so I won't do that. Um, but suffice to say, he's a, a highly experienced, um, has had a very distinguished uh, career, um, and he is also just a, a nice guy and a, a very caring physician. So we're really pleased that I, I'm th thrilled that, that he'll be, be joining um, us here um, and serving the needs of our community. 
Um, the second person that I want to introduce is we do have a nurse practitioner um, in the Bedford, New Hampshire office who's doing non-surgical procedures. Um, she started with us um, about six months ago. Her name is Annika. Um, she is uh, she's lovely, um, so she's she's very nice. Um, she'll be uh, seeing patients for consults, also doing non-surgical um, procedures um, in the New Hampshire office. So welcome to Annika. Um, and then the third person that I want to introduce isn't actually a part of the Boston IVF uh, community, um, but is a, a urologist who's a reproductive trained urologist. Um, his name is uh, Jason Ackerman, and he'll be joining um, uh, Dar Dartmouth Hitchcock. So we have a, a wonderful local urology community who sees our patients um, and is able to do some, some diagnostic um, evaluation. But for patients who need more advanced things like sperm extraction procedures, which sometimes um, we need to do in order to, to uh, retrieve sperm to, to work with for uh, fertility patients, um, those cases traditionally had to had to go to, to Boston um, to have those procedures done. Um, so we're really thrilled that that um, can now be happening uh, again more locally um, here in the New Hampshire community. Um, so uh, Jason's new to our community. He's just finished a fellowship at, at UNC. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to say before I open this up to questions um, is I just wanted to say a thank you to my clinical team. Um, I have a, a wonderful um, nursing team, as I hope some of you, uh, uh, some of you have probably worked with them. Um, and I get wonderful feedback from patients all of the time about how, how caring my team is. And I can tell you that they are not only very competent clinically and, and detail oriented, um, but also really care about their patients. Um, and as, as anybody who's gone through infertility knows, it's, it's, a, it's a personal experience, it's an emotional experience. Um, and I think that having a, a nursing team and a clinical team that, that really gets that and really cares about their patients is, is so important. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, to thank them for, for all of the support that they give um, to all of you. Um, and that's that's my spiel. So I'd be happy to take any any questions from anybody. Um, actually, I hope I can figure out how to do. Oh, there we go. Hang on, I gotta scroll down. <laughs> oh, hi, <laughs> Sherilyn. All right. So lots of hellos from <laughs> from faces that I recognize. Wonderful to see you guys. Um, and let's see, are there med protocols that are different? Um, there's lots of med protocols that are different. Um, this is Jen Ling. Um, so the, all of the medications that you listed are used in the IVF process. Um, there's lots of different protocols um, that can be used. There's also some just variation in individual biology. So sometimes we'll try one protocol, and if it isn't successful, um, you know, try something try something different. Um, hi, Christina. Um, try to understand that question. <laughs> um, So let's see what questions can I answer here. Um, lots of happy patients. Um, embryo number 11, isn't that funny how you remember those things? <laughs> uh, that's, that was from Jesse. Um, all right, well, we, will we be expanding the DOMAR Center currently in Waltham to aid the IVF um, process? So right now, um, we a lot of the DOMAR Center is available for telehealth for counseling visits, which is, is nice. Mental health is, is a silver lining to the crazy pandemic, um, has become a lot more accessible um, through, through telehealth. Um, there are, so we don't have plans to open a DOMAR Center per se um, in New Hampshire, um, but those counselors are certainly available to patients um, online. There are local acupuncturists as well as in-person counselors um, available in New Hampshire, and we, we have a list of those people. So if that's um, something that, that you're interested in, we can definitely um, let, let you know about that. 
Um, there's a Tracy question from Tracy about eggs and um, sperm and whether we can have a baby with an egg donor and a sperm donor. Um, yes, that is an option. Um, we, we the, both of those things are available through egg banks and sperm banks. Um, and as long as you're planning to carry the pregnancy, um, that is something that we can do. We also do gestational carrier cycles, um, but that's uh, usually not egg donor, sperm donor, and a gestational carrier. You usually have to do um, two out of two out of the three. Um, Stephanie has a question about upcoming retrieval. Um, so the New Hampshire Center is still still under construction, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we had uh, initially planned to uh, considering opening at the end of the second quarter of this year. And then COVID hit, and as as you know, life life changed um, rather dramatically. Um, so right now, um, we are we're staying in the same building that we're at right now in um, Bedford, we're, but we're just moving over one suite. So that that suite is currently under construction. Um, so all the equipment, the walls are in, the sinks are in, the counters are in. We've we've been in there wandering around, um, but there's not uh, the the equipment hasn't um, moved in yet. There's an HVAC that's on back order that's supposed to come in at the end of the month. And then I just learned today that some of the, the cubbies are back ordered. So um, a bit of a supply chain <laughs> um, delay related to, uh, to COVID. Um, so we're hoping to open uh, probably November or so of this year, um, but that it is a little bit of a moving target uh, right now, unfortunately. So if you're in cycle right now, um, your retrieval and embryo transfer will still happen in Waltham as, as I've just, uh, as, as you're probably already planning, um, by the end of the year, we'll be able to move that um, uh, locally to New Hampshire. Um, there was a question about the law change, which, um, which I talked about at the beginning. Um, so we are seeing more patients that are able to have um, coverage, insurance coverage for fertility treatment. Um, that's not everybody, um, unfortunately. So if your employer um, is what's called self-insured, um, they're not obligated to, to follow the law and to offer that benefit. We find that in states that have these types of laws that a lot of self-insured plans do decide to, to follow the, the requirement um, and to offer fertility treatment benefit. Uh, so if you don't currently have coverage, it's actually worth a conversation with human resources to talk about that um, because most employers want to be competitive with other employers and offer similar benefits to other employers. Um, so I, that, that does work sometimes. Um, many patients just, just have a benefit now and, and did not used to. Um, but if you are in that category of people who, who doesn't, um, then that's um, something to, again, to talk about with uh, with HR as far as what type of um, fertility insurance plan um, they are, or what type of health insurance, general health insurance um, plan they are they are purchasing. Um, so that's, um, and we st st again, still have self-pay patients and still have um, options for, for self-pay patients um, as far as financing. Um, and then as also uh, there are need-based discounts um, available as well. <laughs> Lindsay says, I'm holding my IUI baby right now, <laughs> two weeks old. Oh my goodness, bless you. It's a, it's a wild and crazy time at the beginning there. Um, so, it's extraction, not sure I understand that then. Federal plans don't offer coverage either. Yeah, um, Tiffany, that is uh, that is an issue. Um, that that one's harder to change um, at, the, at the local level. Um, but yes, uh, federal plans are also not not able to um, to offer uh, treatment, unfortunately. Um, the gestational carrier. Um, so, question about education. Um, we do um, currently educate the the Dartmouth OBGYN um, residents. Um, they rotate through our office. Um, so, um, clinical rotations are available. If you reach out to us, we can put you in in touch with the appropriate people to to coordinate that. Um, Alyssa wants to know what happens at an initial consult, and should I have testing done um, before I come in? Um, 
So some patients come to us just without having any any workup or testing done, and that's that's totally fine. So just you know, I've been trying for a year, and nothing's happening, and you know, help. Um, and and we see lots of patients like that where we will do um, a, a, an appropriate fertility evaluation, um, and then go from there as far as treatment. Um, other patients have done initial testing often with their OBGYN. Um, and sometimes they've done basic treatments too, like taking Clomid or Letrozole or whatever, and, and it hasn't been successful, um, and then they're referred to us. Um, so e either one of those is fine. Um, at the initial visit, expect that it's it's just a conversation about where you're you're at uh, in this process and what has been done, um, or and what what hasn't been done. Um, and then from there, we will order diagnostic testing. Um, usually, especially for well, for the woman, um, that's um, cycle day specific. Um, so it usually takes about a month to do that that evaluation, um, depending upon uh, what what testing is is um, recommended. And then we would meet back after the diagnostic testing is complete, to, so that I can go over all of the results of the testing with you. Um, and at that point, we may talk about um, a treatment plan and, and treatment options. Um, if you've already had some testing done elsewhere, that's great. Um, we do ask you to send those records to us in advance of your first appointment so that we can go over that, um, uh, review that, and see what, what's our, what we already know. Um, and that can you know make the process just kind of move along a little bit uh, faster and ha help us have more of a conversation at the initial visit about um, what, what treatment options might be available for you. Um, so that's what to, to look for in the, the first appointment. Um, there's a question about TESI. After a TESI extraction, how soon after can you start IVF? Um, so with the testicular extraction procedure um, for uh, to retrieve sperm, um, we typically will freeze the sperm. Um, and at that point, it's it's good for many years. Um, so couples can usually start their IVF cycle very shortly thereafter um, in terms of uh, the female starting uh, medications and, and getting ready for, for IVF. Are aneurysms common in pregnant women? Um, they're not any more common in pregnant women than they are in women in general. So um, that's not usually part of a, a fertility evaluation. Um, having our doctor write baby on Monday. <laughs> Kristen, that's amazing. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Um, let's see, talked about insurance coverage. Uh, age cutoff for a donor egg transfer. That's a good question. Um, so the we have uh, age cutoffs for um, for carrying a pregnancy um, is the 50th birthday for women. Um, we do make some exceptions uh, to that on a case by case basis, and that would be reviewed by the physician group if we were going to make an exception to that age cutoff. Um, over the age of 45, there's some additional medical evaluation that would need to be completed to make sure mostly that, that the heart is healthy enough to, to carry a pregnancy. Um, so that would be ordered for women who are planning donor egg IVF over the age of 45, so between 45 and 50. Um, uh, cutoff for IVF using your own eggs is typically the 44th birthday. Um, again, we do make exceptions to that on a case-by-case -case basis, which is reviewed by the physician group. Um, in general, pregnancy rates with IVF using your own eggs after the age of 44 is usually less than 5% per cycle, so it's usually not recommended um, to, to pursue that. Um, fortunately, we do have a, a, an excellent donor egg uh, program, which will continue to be offered and available to all of the New Hampshire patients. Um, so we work with two egg banks, um, which has made the, the whole process for using donor eggs a lot easier than it used to be. Um, at the beginning of my career, we didn't have the, the ability to freeze eggs um, nearly as well as we do today. So that's really, really changed the game um, as far as, as having that option um, available. Um, Again, doing treatments for women using your own eggs between the age of 44 and, and uh, 50 is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. In general, um, it, uh, it, it isn't as successful, um, unfortunately. So you're usually using donor eggs um, in that case is, is recommended. 
Um, let's see what else. It's wonderful to see happy patients on here. Um, FET number 11 is now two months old. That's great. Um, placental issues common in IVF pregnancies. Um, placental issues are slightly increased in, in IVF pregnancies. Um, interestingly, just with fresh transfers. Um, so sometimes we do um, fresh transfers, meaning that we transfer the embryo in the same cycle where we retrieve the eggs. Other times we freeze embryos. Um, with frozen embryo transfers, what's interesting is that pregnancies are a little bit less like, likely um, to have those types of, of placental um, complications. Complications can obviously happen in, in any pregnancy. Those, those things are relatively um, you know, common uh, to see uh, during pregnancy. Um, Pros and cons of the genetic tests, the early one and the one at 10 weeks. Um, so there's all kinds of genetic testing that's available now. Um, at the first appointment, we talk about um, doing genetic carrier screening, which is testing um, to see if um, both members of the couple or the intended parents um, carry any genetic diseases that um, they're at risk for passing on to, to their children. Um, in that case, we do have the option to test embryos for those individual diseases. Um, I think this question is referring more to um, chromosome screening, um, which is offered during pregnancy. We also do have the option to do chromosome testing of embryos. Um, so at the time of IVF, we can perform a biopsy of the of the embryo um, to determine to confirm that it has the correct number of chromosomes. The advantage of that testing is that it screens out embryos that have chromosome problems so that we don't spend time transferring them. Um, the disadvantage is that it does make the process take longer um, because in order to do chromosome testing of embryos, we need to biopsy and then freeze the, the embryos and it, uh, it takes about two weeks to get those test results back. So the IVF process, if you don't do chromosome testing of embryos, is usually one month from starting medications to getting to hopefully a, a positive pregnancy test. Um, if you are doing the PGT, the chromosome testing of embryos, um, then it's more like a three month process from starting medications to getting to, to hopefully a positive pregnancy test. Um, it does reduce miscarriage risk. Um, so there's a variety of situations where the, the PGT is, is really helpful in terms of screening embryos, um, but it's, it's not necessary for, for everybody. Um, there, there is a, a often additional, not always, but often additional cost associated with doing it. So um, depending on the, the individual patient, I would go over the risks and benefits of that testing. In, in your particular case, there's definitely cases where it's absolutely helpful and, and makes sense to do. Um, there's other cases where it's, it's more of an elective thing. Um, we can tell gender, sex of, of the embryo, male or female, by doing that PGT testing. So some couples do elect to do that testing to, um, in order to learn, uh, to learn the sex. Um, so that's an option. Um, and then even if you do testing of embryos um, at the time of IVF, we still strongly encourage you to screen the pregnancy for chromosome um, problems just to confirm the PGT results. Um, like any test, there are false positives and false negatives with, uh, with PGT. So um, doing the, the testing that, that was being referred to at 10 weeks of pregnancy, um, you're still encouraged to do that. A vast majority of the time, PGT is going to detect any sort of chromosomal, chromosomal abnormalities. So usually those will be detected prior to becoming pregnant. Um, but doing that testing um, uh, early on is, is still recommended. Most of the time we're, we're doing that these days, not, um, not invasively, so not requiring amnio synthesis, um, but more just blood testing and, and ultrasound uh, monitoring um, for the pregnancy. Um, does the Bedford office do surgical procedures? So yes, right now we are doing, um, we're not doing surgical procedures, we're doing uh, just IUI procedures, which are artificial in insemination procedures. Um, once the new center opens, we'll be doing the, um, all of the IVF procedures, including egg retrieval and embryo transfers um, right, uh, right in New Hampshire. Um, so that's great. Oh, miscarriage at 17 weeks. That's terrible. I'm really sorry to, to hear that, Laura. Um, there's definitely options. Um, there's a variety of reasons why later losses like that can, can happen. Um, so if the issue was, was getting pregnant in, in the first place, we can help with that. 
Um, so some workup will usually be done for those later types of losses to try to determine why that happened. Um, so we don't always have a good answer, um, but there's definitely some diagnostic testing um, that we should do. Um, and then based on the results of that testing, we can uh, make a plan for the next pregnancy. Losing a pregnancy is so hard, I, regardless of when it happens, I, the later it, it happens, you know, the, the worse it, it feels. Um, it, for what it's worth, I've had many patients that have lost pregnancies over the years, and, and many of them go on to have very successful pregnancies in the future. So it can feel like a, a really low place when you've gone through something like that. Um, but it, it, it does get, get better. It's a one day at a time kind of a thing, especially if that, that recently happened. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, how soon can you do another IVF cycle after giving birth? Um, so recommend to wait a minimum of three months um, after pregnancy to have another baby. And that's true regardless of whether it was an IVF procedure or not an IVF procedure. Um, if you've had a C-section for delivery, um, especially if you want to try for a vaginal birth with your next pregnancy, um, then ideally we'd have you wait um, between uh, 6 and 12 months from the C-section to, to get pregnant again. Um, that's just to allow that C-section scar to heal. Everybody's situation is a little bit different. Um, so sometimes age is a factor, for example, um, and the fertility in women goes down with age. So we need to be aware of that. Um, and so sometimes doing earlier treatments, even when you've had a C-section is something that we can consider. If you look at optimal interpregnancy interval, um, so it's best to have your, your next baby in terms of obst obstetric outcomes, when your first baby is between nine and 18 months. Now that doesn't mean you have to have your, your second baby when your first baby is between nine and 18 months um, or that you have to space them that way, um, but that's kind of a kind of optimal. So um, so minimum three months with a vaginal birth um, with a, a C-section, uh, at least nine months would, would be recommended, but it depends a little bit on your individual goals and, um, and situations. Um, Janine, thank you for the two children I have through IVF and a surprise child <laughs> and three boys. I'm sure you're busy, Janine. <laughs> um, boys, little boys have a lot of energy. Um, and then let's see, Laura says, if a previous latch was all cycle worked at a specific dose, would you approach baby number two treatment with that dose right away? Or would you start low and then move up as needed? Um, usually when someone has been successful with IVF treatment, um, we would go back to what worked. Um, so I would usually resume whatever dose they were on previously, unless, unless there's been some change. Sometimes if someone's had, you know, a lot of weight loss or their updated testing looks a lot different, then, then we might consider a different dose. Um, but in general, we, we would go back to what worked. So if you conceived at a specific dose, we would, um, we would generally keep that the same for the next attempt. Um, similarly, if you um, did in the past did IUI treatment and then moved on to IVF treatment and, and were successful with that, if you come back for the next baby, we wouldn't go back to, to IUI treatment necessarily, usually, um, unless you, you wanted to or unless there was some reason to do that. Usually we would just resume back with, with IVF treatment. Um, and you don't have to try again. I, I get that question occasionally that, you know, I tried to, for a year um, to have my first baby and then we... Um, I had to go to IVF. Do I have to try for a year before I do go to IVF again with my second baby? And, and the answer is no, <laughs> um, you, don't, you don't have to wait. Um, so once you have a diagnosis of, of infertility, you, you have that diagnosis. And so um, resuming um, fertility treatment, uh, you know, as soon as you want your next baby is, is, uh, is what we'd recommend that you do. <laughs> Tammy says I'm crushing it. I don't know about that, Tammy, but thank you. <laughs> um, Tammy's a medical assistant in our office. Um, I appreciate my team's moral support here in this uh, this venture. Uh, let's see, Valentine. I had a transfer done yesterday. I know cramping is normal, but I have a pulling and a tugging in my right ovary. Is that common? Um, so, crampy, bloaty, pulling discomfort um, is is really really common after transfer, um, and you know you're so hyper tuned to it too because you're you know you just had this transfer and you're hoping that it works. Um, so if you had an egg retrieval, your ovaries are usually still enlarged um, and, and those ovaries will take a couple of weeks to go back down. So, so don't worry too much about uh, any sort of uh, you know, cramping, not non-severe pain is, is really common and, and very, very normal. Um, 
very severe pain is not normal. That that's you know pretty uncommon to see after an IVF cycle. Um, there's a, a rare risk of like a, a cyst rupturing. Usually that would just heal itself. We don't usually have to do anything to to make that better. Um, but that can happen occasionally. So if you're in severe pain, you should you should call us or you should go to the emergency room. If you're having tugging, pulling pain, that's that's really common and normal. We wouldn't be worried about that. Um, you can definitely you know call your call your team if if you want reassurance about what's going on with you specifically. But but don't be too concerned about that. Um, Let's see, I am, I think currently four weeks pregnant, thanks to this awesome team. My question is, do you guys do everything as labor and checkout visits, et cetera? Do I have to find an OBGYN doctor? So you do graduate from us um, once you are successfully pregnant. Um, so what we would do is do your um, pregnancy test, um, and then we follow your pregnancy hormone levels to confirm that they are rising appropriately. Um, as long as that looks okay, we'll do an ultrasound usually about three weeks after you've had your positive pregnancy test to make sure that the pregnancy is progressing. We can usually see a heartbeat on the ultrasound at that point. Um, as long as everything looks good with that appointment, then we then you graduate from us uh, on to, to prenatal care. Um, we, we really encourage you to still stay in touch with us. Um, we love to hear back from you um, as, as I, I'm getting to do today, which is great. Um, but yes, you, you will get another doctor, you'll get an OBGYN. Um, there's wonderful uh, OBGYNs in the community. We can definitely uh, make some recommendations for you if you're looking for someone um, in, in your area. Um, let's see, how costly is it to um, pick gender? That, yeah. Um, so PGT testing is sometimes covered by insurance, but not usually. Um, and it was, it, it's usually between three and $5,000 to do that level of, of testing. Um, and we would go through uh, that cost with you if you uh, decided to do that. Um, Jesse said, I was so sad when I graduated. <laughs> um, and then I saw, let's see, I saw Brenda on here say hi. And I saw my mom. So hi, mom. Um, and then is surgery needed to remove fibroids prior to IVF? So sometimes, but not always. Um, it depends on the location of the, the fibroids. Um, the fibroids are benign growths of the muscle wall of, of the uterus. They're acquired conditions. Um, so it's something that, that you develop uh, in your life, not something that, that you're, you're, you're born with. Um, they are very common. Fibroids that we're concerned about from a fertility perspective are larger fibroids, so greater than four to five centimeters. Um, can can affect your ability to become pregnant and can can increase miscarriage risk, um, or fibroids that are in the lining of the uterus. Um, so if you have fibroids, that would usually be identified at the initial uh, an ultrasound. So a, an ultrasound is uh, ordered as part of the fertility evaluation to look for issues like fibroids. Um, and then depending if fibroids are found, um, it depends on their size and location. Sometimes we have to do additional imaging to get a good sense for, for their size and location and whether they're in the lining of the uterus or not. Um, those additional tests can include um, a saline sauna histogram. So that's where we would put some, um, it's a procedure where we would put some water into the uterus um, to distend the uterine cavity. That's the, the uterine cavity is where the baby would grow. Um, and that allows us to see inside really well to see whether the fibroids appear to be pushing into that area or, or not. Um, the other test that we will occasionally do is, is MRI testing, um, can also give us a better sense, sometimes an ultrasound, um, especially with a larger uterus or a uterus that has multiple fibroids, um, to determine whether they appear to be an issue or not. Um, fibroids that are completely outside of the uterus, um, or fibroids that are, are less than four to five centimeters in that muscle wall of the uterus, um, are, are unlikely to, to impact um, pregnancy. It's a fairly major surgery to remove fibroids, so we'd only recommend that if we think that it's um, necessary for you. Um, fortunately, most of the time um, it is it is not. Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of Candace and Jesse. You're making me laugh here. <laughs> um, is there an email to send pictures to? Yes, we can share our. Um, you just call us. We'll we can give you um, our email addresses. We we certainly love um, getting pictures. Um, let's see what are the questions that we have. Jenna has a 19 month old. We're ready for another transfer. Um, 
so uh, initial appointments are, are booking out, I think, three to four weeks right now. Melissa is my, Melissa's on here. She's my admin who schedules my appointments. Um, and I know she's working hard to, to get everybody in. It's It's been busy this year. Um, you know, we had a, obviously a, a sort of a brief lull with, with COVID, um, but we've, we have a lot of patients right now who are, who are looking to come back for their babies. So we're, we're certainly happy to see you. Um, let's see. Is it common to skip a period a few months after egg retrieval, waiting egg retrieval due to the medications? The medications can affect menses. Um, kind of depends what's what's going on there. Um, if you if you have questions, your period doesn't seem to be doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, we can always do blood testing to see where you're at in the cycle. Um, sometimes we need to um, take give hormones to induce you to have a period. So if, if you're waiting to do treatment or waiting to do specific tests, um, we can usually treat that um, with medications. We, we sometimes we'll do some blood work first to see if you're not getting your period, why that might be. Um, there's a, a variety of, of things that can cause that. Sometimes there's hormonal issues that, that we need to address. Um, so um and let's see is bruising of the abdomen normal after retrieval it can be um so sometimes when we do the egg retrieval procedure which is done under anesthesia so you're asleep for this part um the uh, a needle is going through the vaginal wall and into the ovary during that procedure um, sometimes we need to actually press on your abdomen during the egg retrieval in order to see the ovary. Um, so we need the ovary to be as close to the, the needle as, as possible um, for us to be able to access the eggs. Um, so sometimes um, we, there, we have an assistant actually pressing on your abdomen um, in order for us to access the ovary. So if you're seeing some bruising there, that, that might be related to that. Um, and that's normal if it's severe. If you have questions, of course, call us and let us know. Um, but I would not be concerned about some, some minor bruising that you're seeing there that's likely just um, related to the, the procedure. Um, do we always use birth control prior to starting medications or is it a case by case basis? Um, it's a case by case basis. Um, so um, often birth control pills are, are really helpful um, for uh, timing the, the cycle. Um, it gives you some control over when we're going to actually do the, the IVF cycle. Um, but it's not always required in those other medications that we can use if needed to, to manipulate the start of the cycle. Other times we don't need to manipulate the start of the cycle. So um, that, that really depends. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? <laughs> we do hang, hang Christmas cards all over the office. Um, Can you store freeze eggs if we want to? Yes. Um, so there's a variety of reasons why freezing eggs make sense. Um, women sometimes do it now for, for fertility preservation, uh, especially women who are in their early 30s, uh, don't maybe haven't met the, the right partner yet, um, or sometimes they're just not sure if they, they want a parent yet, but want the option to do so. Um, so freezing eggs in that case um, will do something to preserve fertility for the future because as, especially as you get over the age of 35, your fertility will naturally uh, decline as, as a function of, of age. Um, so freezing eggs in that situation um, is certainly something that, that we do. Um, we also will um, commonly freeze embryos. Um, so we'll usually freeze any extra embryos that we have from an IVF cycle for, for later use. Um, and that's to your advantage to do because if we do a fresh embryo transfer and it doesn't take, um, we can do a frozen embryo transfer and not have to do all of the IVF procedures, including the egg retrieval procedure um, all over again. We can just use a frozen embryo and that's a much easier process. Um, and in couples who are partnered who know that they want uh, more than one child um, and are ready to parent, um, we would uh, freezing embryos is sometimes makes more sense um, than than freezing eggs, but both are, are certainly an option. Um, and again, that's great because it, it, it wasn't something that was a good option at the beginning of my career, but we now um, do frozen frozen eggs um, on a, a pretty regular basis um, for a variety of reasons. Do you do transfers at your new facility in Bedford? Yes, we will be um, just as soon as the, the offices or the, the new office, I should say, is, is open. Um, so yes, we'll be doing egg retrievals um, as well as embryo transfers 
um, in the Bedford office, Jenna, so um, that will all be able to be accessed locally. Um, Jen has two beautiful children, hi Jen. Um, You and your team are truly amazing and so supportive. Oh, um, I did the trans. Uh, hi, Lisa. Not only was I blessed to have you as a doctor, but you did my transfer as well. I felt like I won the lottery currently 20 weeks pregnant. Oh, that's wonderful. We look forward to seeing your baby picture. Um, this is fun for me to get to see all you guys. <laughs> Let's see, can you PGS test previously frozen embryos? I have four frozen, but not PGS tested. My first cycle was successful. Um, so the answer to that, Marilyn, is, is yes. Um, if you already have frozen embryos, we do have the option to test them. There are some downsides to that um, because we would have to thaw the embryos, biopsy them, and then refreeze them. There is some risk of losing embryos anytime you do a freeze-thaw. The vast majority of embryos survive the freeze-thaw process. Um, so 96 to 98% do survive, um, but always a small chance anytime you freeze anything that it doesn't survive the freeze-thaw process. Um, so that's the only risk um, to, to testing them um, is that that small risk associated with the freeze-thaw um, but it is something that, that we do for a variety of, of, of reasons um, so that you can learn whether uh, any of the embryos have chromosome abnormalities or would be expected to, to not be viable and that way we don't spend time transferring them. Um, on the flip side, if you were, were, were successful with your, your first cycle, um, it, it may not be something that's, that's you know, necessary for you to do. Um, so depending on, on your goals, sometimes we do the testing to look at, at sex of embryos, and, and that's certainly fine if, if that's your goal. Um, but uh, we'd uh, be able to determine chromosome abnormalities with that testing as well. Um, do you do transfers and retrievals in Waltham? So I will be until I until we open the center in New Hampshire, and then once the center in New, is in New Hampshire, I won't be doing um, retrievals and transfers in Waltham anymore. But I'd love to see you, Stephanie. Hopefully, our our stars will will align. Um, how long are frozen eggs good? That's a good question. And you know, we don't have a perfect answer to that. But the answer is they're good for a long time. Um, they're in liquid nitrogen, so they're they're very in, inert um, and they don't appear to get freeze or burn or, or suffer any ill effects from, from long-term storage. Um, I think the oldest embryo that we've had um, in our lab is at least 15 years old and it did well with the freeze-thaw process. Um, so the way we freeze embryos is, has changed um, a lot over time. It's gotten a lot better. Um, so sometimes embryos that were frozen a long time ago um, don't do quite as well with the freeze thaw process. Um, the process we do now is a process called vitrification, which is more of a flash freezing type process. Uh, and embryos uh, do, do very well with that. Um, it used to be that embryos that were frozen didn't have the same uh, potential for pregnancy as, as embryos that hadn't been frozen. And that's really changed. Um, with uh, with improvements and in, in how we freeze embryos, so um, it's a, a lot of our, our cycles now are, are frozen embryo transfers, and we have a lot of success with that, which is which is great. Um, the same is presumably true of eggs. You know, we haven't been freezing eggs for as long um, as we've been freezing embryos. And eggs are, are tricky to freeze. Um, it's interesting because an egg and an embryo, the day five embryo, are roughly the same size, um, but the egg is much more fragile because it has a much higher water content um, compared to the cell uh, membrane content um, as an embryo. Uh, compared to an embryo. So um, it's important that you have a very experienced lab doing egg freezes and egg thaws. Um, fortunately, we have a, a highly experienced lab. Um, I saw Donna on here. She's one of our sen senior embryologists actually who, who lives in New Hampshire and has been commuting to Waltham um, and will be um, joining us once we open the, the new center. She can speak very intelligently to all of these questions um, as well. Um, but freezing eggs and, and freezing embryos is, is certainly an option, um, depending on your, your circumstances. Uh, let's see. Have other questions here. See members of my team on here. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thanks for your support. Um, let's see, can we schedule the repeat testing blood work ultrasound sono prior to an appointment to move forward with FBT or do we need to meet with you first? 
Um, so if it's mostly a matter of just updating testing that's been done previously, then then no, you don't have to meet with me first. We can just uh, order that testing. I know my, um, especially if, if we're, we're booking out a little bit for, for appointments. Um, if it's if it's a new evaluation or something else is recommended, then then usually we'd have you discuss that with with me or or Annika uh, first. Um, but if you're just updating testing that's been done previously, or if you're coming back for your second baby, for example, um, you can call it, and uh, usually the nurses will run that by me just to make sure that there's nothing else that, that I want for for you specifically. Um, but as long as that's uh, not the case, then then yes, we can just update um, your testing. Um, to, to get you moving <laughs> along with the with the process. Um, okay, so I answered that. And then when do you anticipate allowing partners support systems to accompany each other for testing and treatments? That's such a great question, Mary Kate. And I know that's uh, that's been hard um, because it's it's been a change related to COVID. Um, so we used to welcome partners into the the building for uh, for really any procedure, but especially um, people patients really like having their partner there for sometimes for IUI um, procedures, insemination procedures, as well as as embryo transfer procedures are um, you know obviously are, are very exciting um, events, and it's nice to have a support person and, and have your partner there with you. Because of COVID, we haven't been doing that um, just for safety reasons. Um, the embryo transfer you know, room is, is fairly small, and so people have to be pretty close together. Um, so there are concerns about um, transmission of, of COVID. Um, we are actively working on that, um, and we're actually working on, at least as a, a temporary measure, doing that as a, a virtual experience. Um, so we've actually purchased some iPads and we're, we're trialing this, so it's not going to be fully rolled out yet. Um, we have to make sure that it's it's HIPAA compliant and, and that sort of thing. So it's not we can't have you FaceTiming just with your phone, um, but we have some dedicated iPads that we're going to trial that. So hopefully that'll work, um, that it, at least for now, your partners can be there virtually. And that's not quite the same as being there holding your hand, but but at least they're, you know, they're there with you um, and, and able to um, to be a part of the experience. Um, so we, we know that that's important to, to you guys. I, I totally get that. Um, we're trying to balance, you know, that that um, uh, wanting to, to have that emotional uh, support um, with just the, the safety and the reality of, of the COVID situation. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, Jesse says, I gave birth to a little boy in March, thanks to you, and I am looking to see how long we are. Uh, to wait before we try another, I have 10 frozen. Good job. And would like to do genetic testing the second time around, hoping to have a girl. With this being our goal, any insight on an approximate time for this? Um, so the steps when you come back for treatment are similar to the initial steps um, and that we would need to update some fertility testing. It's not as much testing as we do at the first visit, but there are some things that change, uh, especially in women with time and with age, and men too. We'd update a semen analysis if we needed more sperm. It sounds like, Jesse, you have 10 frozen embryos, so we probably won't be, be needing more of that. Um, so updating testing, um, and then if you want to do a biopsy, we schedule those with the lab. It does take about, uh, we schedule the a time for the biopsy to be performed with the lab. It does take about two weeks to get those test results back. Um, so if you have 10, 10 embryos, we would um, thaw them, biopsy them, and then refreeze them, um, and then wait for the those results to come back and then go over those results with you. So from coming in for an initial um, new patient visit to starting treatment is usually a, a three-month process or so, um, and it, it is similar when you come back um, for, for care because we do have to update, um, as I said, some of that fertility testing just to make sure that nothing has changed and to determine the, the right plan for you, um, and then we'd move uh, forward with treatment um, after, after that time. Um, are we doing on time? Oh, hour went by quickly. Um, let's see. just want to make sure I get, um, computer. there we go. Um, let's see. Oh, actually, that's very nice. Um, your IVF baby is two years old in the light of, light of, light of her life. It's 
It's amazing how much parenthood changes you. It's uh, it's a wonderful experience. I'm glad you, I'm glad you're able to experience it. Um, never thought it would be so hard to start a family. Isn't that true? It's uh, you know, it's not something that anybody thinks is going to happen to them. Uh, but 15% um, of the population, it's not as uncommon as as people think. So. Um, and then Tiffany says, are you planning a baby bull thing? <laughs> yeah, we did do a baby bull for our uh, Boston Aviav's 25th uh, anniversary. Um, we did a baby bull in Gillette Stadium with a bunch of, of patients and, and babies that we'd helped. Um, that was amazing. I think I think COVID's probably not going to allow us to do that again, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully sometime soon. Hopefully sometime soon. Um, let's see, we've got about five minutes left. And so if anybody has any other any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer those for you. Um, <laughs> you are welcome, Laura. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, Gillette was fantastic. It's uh, it's empty now, which is kind of kind of strange. Um, so um, we have about four minutes left. So I'll I'll just um, wrap up here. Um, it, you know, it's I, I don't go on social media all that that often, but it it is wonderful when I do just to see all all of these these comments and and happy patients, and we're so helpful to. Uh, you know, so happy that, that we've helped you to, to have your, your families. Um, as far as, you know, if you have any questions, um, certainly if you're an existing patient, obviously please call us with any questions or, or concerns that, that you have. If you're a prospective patient, uh, we'd, we'd love to see you and help you, <laughs> help you to have your family. Um, you know, my, my, piece of advice for you is that it, you, we can usually help and sometimes the the first step is the hardest to take. Um, so um, a lot of people, you know, tell me that they're very nervous at their first first new patient visit and, and nervous about what they're going to say and uh, what, what, what I'm going to say and, and what what is going to need to happen. Um, but sometimes the first step is the hardest to take, you know, when you're trying to get pregnant and it's just not happening and it's it's so frustrating and it can feel feel very lonely. Um, but we're, we're here for you. Um, so, you know, whatever struggles you're having, um, there's, there's usually help available to you. So that's the most important thing that, that I want you to know if you're out there and you're, you're, you know, suffering silently and it's, it's not working, um, you know, seeking help. Sometimes the first step is, is the hardest one to take. Um, so I encourage you to reach out if you have questions. Um, we, we're certainly happy to happy to to see you and to take care of you, um, and we appreciate your your support um, supporting us and all the kind words today. <laughs> um, so I think I will wrap up there. Thank you all for joining um, this this adventure, and um, I hope to talk to you guys soon. Okay, take care. Bye bye.